Today, we're excited to welcome Isabel Sakai to the show. Isabel is the Global Chief Marketing Officer for the Mark Anthony Group based in Zurich. She's in charge of marketing, planning, and strategy for the many brands they look after, including White Claw, a very popular brand, which we're here to talk about today. Isabel, so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining. Well, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, absolutely. And where are you joining in from today? Actually, in Dublin, uh, Ireland, uh, where Mark Anthony Group has its international headquarters. Gotcha. And 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 do you travel often around the world for your role? Because it seems like a very international company with, with many different locations. It is. You are absolutely right. Um, so I'm actually located in Zurich, Switzerland. That's my home base. I'm very often here in Dublin to be with my team, my global team. Uh, but I travel um, a lot around the world, in particular in North America. So Chicago um, is our um, you know home office for the US. And then we have Toronto and Vancouver. We are a Canadian company. Originally, our founder, Anthony van Mandel, is Canadian. Gotcha. Now, and, and just to kind of wind back the clock a little bit, you started your career at P&G, mm -hmm. uh, where you actually worked for nearly 20 years. Um, I say this all the time, but it is such a common theme at the podcast that so many people that end up in the CMO seat started their career at P&G. What is it about P&G that makes it such a special place to work? And what were some of your core takeaways from your time there? P&G is truly a remarkable company. I'm extremely grateful uh, for having joined that company at the very start of my career um, because it's truly a learning ground. So you are extremely well trained in everything that can make you successful as a marketeer, but also as a leader. So I think that's, that explains why you have so many CMOs that are coming from P&G. Um, you are trained in um, obviously brand building, advertising development, uh, consumer and market understanding, um, data analysis, and more. Um, on, you know, you have a very regular program of training courses, but they also invest a lot in you as a leader and as someone who really understands how to build organizations. So it makes us very, very um, complete. <laughs> you know, we have a very broad profile um, after working at PNG. And then, of course, you have uh, that diversity of the company in terms of uh, the number of categories, the beautiful brands. Um, marketing is also the lead function. Uh, so obviously, right. a lot of, yeah, you're entrusted with a lot of responsibilities very early on. But fantastic company. Yeah. And on top of that, I also see that you worked in many different markets, um, you know, during your stint at P&G. Um, you know, what impact do you think working globally and being a true international executive has had, especially starting in that path early in your career? I recommend warmly to anyone to try to relocate and to work internationally because it's been such a growth experience for me, Matt, really. Um, you know, when you go to a different market and you, you leave there, you go to a different country, you're discovering a new culture, new food, a uh, new language, you work with very different people, um, you're also rediscovering your own country because you look at it differently with an external lens. You learn to be more adaptable, more flexible. You you overall you broaden your perspective. So it's really an incredible experience to do that. Yeah, I think often, especially here in America, you know, we kind of get the misperception that the way it is here in America is the way it is everywhere, and the cultural norms exist everywhere. And that's anything but the case, as you know better than anyone. <laughs> so I think being worldly and having that large world view just helps you understand different perspectives and um, the way that people live around the world and it'll just make you a better professional. I think also earlier in your career, you're probably less likely to have a family or have things that are holding you down. So you actually do have that opportunity. Absolutely. I agree with everything you said yeah. and more. <laughs> yeah, cool. So so, so you made the decision um, after being at PG nearly 20 years uh, to join Mondelez, another fantastic global CPG brand, what goes behind the decision to leave a company, you know, like PNG? You're obviously working your way up the chain there and working with new categories. And then one day you wake up and you decide you're leaving. What, what goes behind a decision like that? Mm -hmm. um, it's not a, a light decision to take. Um, and, and frankly, I've, I've loved every single day at work at PNG. So I think what is important when you're changing companies actually not to run away from something. It's actually to run towards something else yeah. because there comes a point in time where um, I don't want to say you've seen it all, but you are in your comfort zone. 
you know, after right. 17 years at P&G, uh, I felt I've, I've, you know, I've seen so many different categories in so many different markets and I've worked in local and regional and global marketing. I worked also corporate um, on the P&G brand and I've, I've done a lot of things. But at the end of the day, especially because the culture is so strong, you know, it's always the same ways of working, it's the same codes, it's the same approaches. So if you really want to develop again and stretch yourself, uh, changing environment is actually a good idea. And this is what happened to me. It coincided really with, um, you know, me passing the, the 15 year mark. You start to say, okay, hmm, it's been a long time, really. And then Mondelez knocked at my door. So it was the combination. Again, I, I was excited by, by Mondelez discovering the world of food. As you said, an amazing company, great product, great brands, great people. Uh, so I wanted to to go and discover a, a different world, really. Yeah, and I think uh, you're right. What you're talking about is basically complacency and people get used to you know, the way that things are and why change it. But I think sometimes growth comes by embracing you know, the discomfort and, and going to something new and, and obviously allows you to grow as a professional. So, and, and then you, know, you spent some time you know, working at other organizations in the marketing function. And then in 2023, last year, you joined as global CMO at the Mark Anthony Group. For those that don't know about that organization, tell us a little bit about the Mark Anthony Group. Mm. So Mark Anthony is a founder-led business. So our founder is Anthony von Mendel. Um, after 50 years, he's as excited and enthusiastic and passionate about the company as on his first day. Um, a, a visionary leader, uh, someone that we really all look up to, um, is someone who is passionate about wine. <laughs> uh, so owns a lot of uh, prestigious wineries in British Columbia um, in, in uh, Canada. Um, and he's the one who invented the um, flavored malt business category uh, with Mike's Hard Lemonade. I'm sure you know uh, this brand. Yeah. 25 years this year. Uh, yeah. Um, and then, of course, um, I launched White Claw, the creator, the OG of Hot Seltzer. And so difficult to uh, create brands or launch brands or creating a new segment for consumers. And Anthony did it twice. So yeah, I mean, that, that's a lot of respect. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to create a new category in such a competitive industry is nearly impossible to do because it almost feels like at a certain point everything's already been done right and i had no idea before you just told me just now that they also were behind the hard lemonade category which obviously was another huge hit um you know so i guess what goes behind that process and you probably know a little bit more about the white call brand because it's more recent but what goes behind the r d and innovation process to have mm -hmm. the to essentially create a new category? Mm. Matt, it all starts with really understanding the consumers <laughs> and what they are missing. So whether they, they know it or not, by the way, <laughs> right. it's really truly understanding what are those unmet needs and what um, is the gap in the market. Yeah. So if, if I take the example of, of White Claw, so there's a need for product that are very sessionable, right? That you can drink a lot of. And, and typically beer was, was meeting that need. Except that when you think about it, it's not the best product um, when you want to drink a lot of something over a long period of time, because right. it's quite heavy and it yeah. leaves you a little bit bloated and it's high in calories. And so we saw that and said, okay, we need a product that is going to be much lighter, 100 calories and, and you know, some nice airy uh, bubbles, yeah. um, but something that is also full of flavors, beautiful flavors, because uh, when you're drinking a lot of something, flavor is actually making it much more enjoyable and gluten-free because you saw that it was a little bit of a concern as well, surfacing with, you know, with well-being um, becoming a, a rising uh, obsession. Um, so, so he saw the opportunity, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to carve out my space with a very sessional product that is going to answer better the need that consumers have. It worked. Yeah, because one thing I noticed personally about White Claw, and I don't know what the data shows, but females um, really gravitated towards White Claw uh, because there wasn't really, you know, something that spoke to them that was kind of in the same form factor. So, you know, there's obviously wine, but wine is not in the same form factor and it's not as easily accessible. And then there's beer, but this is sort of something that 
I kind of, it, it filled the need of being easily accessible, um, it had the form factor of beer, but to your point, it was much lighter um, and, and had better taste. And I think those are probably core drivers. Is White Claw today a, a brand that's focused more on the female demographic? And, and how does it break down in terms of usage? It's pretty much 50-50, which wow. is remarkable in this category. Wow. Mm-hmm. So you come up with a new category and obviously it starts with, I totally get identifying the consumer need, but your category has all these other key elements in making it successful. First and foremost being distribution. I would imagine given the fact that Mark Anthony had other brands in their portfolio, made it easier to get distributors to carry it and to gain adoption. But I guess what sorts of hurdles does a brand have in a new category gaining uh, distribution? Mm. I think it's really about being able to explain to cons- to customers, um, or actually through our distributors, uh, as you know, the structure of the alcohol uh, category in the US, to explain that it's really going to come incremental. Yeah. So everything that I just explained about you coming in and carving out your own space, you know, better answering consumers' needs is critical. Because then they see, ah, okay, so really we're going to be able to grow again because we're going to provide a product consumers are really looking for without really knowing it. And it's going to create new, vo- new volume for us. Right. This is what is absolutely critical to be, to be uh, listed. And then it's all about driving velocity um, because consumers are actually picking on it. And as you know, we ex- literally exploded in, in 2019. It became that huge phenomenon everyone was talking about. Everyone tried to copy us, by the way. They still are. <laughs> yeah. And they still are. You're right. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that, that's what it takes. You, you need to first explain well why you are going to come incremental to the category and create value for them. And then you need consumers to embrace it fast. So uh, it's so much in demand that basically people were asking for it. We, we ran out of stock, as you know, at the beginning and uh, <laughs> because we could not meet the demand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I remember that in 2019. And I guess when something takes off so fast, especially in this category, it always runs the risk of being a fad that, you know, people look back at and say, oh, do you remember what light call everyone was drinking at this summer? And now the other big competitors have come in and they almost become sort of a Trojan horse for the category, but then ultimately they go away. And white call has had staying power. What does it need to do to continue to have staying power in a a category that, again, is highly competitive and is going to continue to have new entrants into the space? Mm. Um, one of the reasons why we're still there strong, actually stronger than ever with 63% of the segment wow. is because we never compromise on product quality. So when there was this, what we call the gold rush, you know, everyone, yeah. every single competitor out there say, ah, we want our fair share of the, you know, hot salsa category. They launched so many different products. And frankly, we were not really differentiated and the product was not always of a great quality. We stayed the course on having superior product. Um, you know, we continued investing behind the brand, even though we were under attack everywhere. Um, and, you know, we are now really entering what we call the consolidation phase. Um, we are the clear leader. We believe one or two brands will will stay and mm-hmm. all the rest will disappear. Um, that That is what is happening typically when, when you are a, a true uh, market disruptor. So yeah. you're saying the course. As important product is the other big piece in terms of the consumer is brand and building the brand. Uh, with that, you recently announced the launch of a new campaign from White Claw called Grab Life by the Claws, uh, mm-hmm. and a whole brand platform. Tell us about that. Mm. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful brand platform, um, actually. And, and, and you said it correctly. It's so much more than a one-off campaign. It is a true platform. Um, it was born out of consumer understanding, again, uh, really listening to to consumers and what they told us is uh, they have never felt more isolated. The pandemic didn't help, um, yeah. but in this hyper connected world, what they are telling us is they actually feel lonely. I was yeah. listening to to the news this morning and and heard about I don't know if you heard that, but about um, Korean consumers actually having what they call a pet rock. It's something that that we used to have in the US. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, and, and because they are so Tomodachi desperate either. for having, yeah, yeah, equivalent, but so desperate for, for having, you know, someone to talk to, sadly enough. So it's a true human need. We know that actually um, in, 
strong personal interaction, social connection is the first driver of happiness. That's what makes a human and health, fulfilled. You, and health. People yeah, are everything. So you, you yeah. need contact with other people. So when we heard that, we said, wow, but this is us. This is, this is what we do. White Claw is all about that. Consumers talk about having a White Claw moment. So when they just want to socialize with their friends, swap stories around a white claw, something impromptu, fun, lighthearted. And this is really the way, the, 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 the role we play in their life. So that, that was really what um, was the origin of the Grab Live or the Claw campaign. It's all about celebrating togetherness, having a great moment of shared fun. Yeah. And it, it obviously, we had this big rush of the experience economy where it was all about experiences and not things. And then the pandemic hit and then everyone retreated and, and ran up their Amazon bills and, and bought TVs for every room in a house. And then we had post pandemic, we had sort of like this rage travel era where everyone was kind of going out. And now we sort of settled into, I think, where we were before. But I think with that, you're right. Like people are, are scarred from going through the pandemic. We also have now people talking to AI. Right. And there's all these new technologies. And the more people rely on technology in a lot of cases, the less they rely on that human interaction. So I guess in some ways it is counterculture and, and it is driving that human connection. And I guess your brand, you see your brand as a big part of that human connection. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, we we are committed to um, help people, you know, reconnect with their old friends, meet new friends, be part of, uh, of that to make their lives a little bit better. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Totally makes sense. And when, you, and when you look at media channels mm -hmm. or to get your message across and connect with consumers, where are some areas that you're focused on here in 2024, given your consumer segment you're trying to target? I'm going to surprise you by, by telling you we invest a lot in social media. This is uh -huh. where a lot of things happen those days, not new. But something that might be a little bit different than what other brands do is, is our commitment to meet our consumers in real life. We are very invested in, in being present at, at festivals, in particular music festival all around the country. Um, and uh, we have what we call the Shore Club which is, um, you know, uh, a platform, our bar, if you want, where we uh, sell our product, but also invite them to um, have experience with White Claw. Oh, with um, it, with and it, and, so you're creating your own. Yes, absolutely. 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 And, and we want to, to further develop that uh, to, you know, foster that two-way conversation. That's really what we're committed to, very much in line with, with, what we stand for, right? Togetherness, Absolutely. bringing people together, refreshing social connections. And and does White Call also play a lot in more traditional media like linear television and building its brand? Or has that not really been a big part of your story since, since the launch? <laughs> TV is not dead. Absolutely. Right. I'm with you 200%. You need that for broad awareness and a little bit of prestige as well. So it's, it, it won't surprise you. That's just a new brand that gains trust and loyalty in because you're still such a relatively new brand compared to some of the other brands that play in your space. I would imagine that that kind of gets you that gravitas that you need for consumers to trust the brand over the long term and make sure it isn't a fad. Exactly. You said very well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So let's um, shift gears a little bit uh, to you <laughs> and, and your career, because obviously like you're in a really important seat for a, a company that obviously has a huge success on its hands and, and it's your job to A, not screw it up, which I know you won't, but <laughs> you can find growth I'll opportunities. Try. How do you stay, I guess, in a growth mode as a professional so you keep learning and growing because the marketing and, and media space changes so quickly. What do you do personally to make sure that you have your finger on the pulse of where the market is and where the consumer is? So we do a lot of social listening. Matt, I think it's really, really important. We uh, we do that very regularly and we learn a lot about what consumers say about our product, but also how they use our product, what they're missing in our product, what they want to hear from us, what, you know, they, they talk about everything. It's unbelievable. It's such a source of of, uh, of uh, interesting um, data point. And, and uh, it's particularly important for us when it comes to innovation. Uh, because obviously we are aware that they love our white little hot seltzer, but um, things, you know, that the drinking habits keep on evolving. Um, and so we've listened, we've listened, we've seen, um, for example, just as an example, that they are changing their drinking habits. They want more and more to experience with non alk um, and that led us to actually launch not our a, white low zero percent. Absolutely, it's a right. huge. I mean, seventy yeah. percent today of the population is actually considering a damp lifestyle, 
you know, yeah. so not really abandoning alcohol because it's still a lot of fun and pleasure and, and everything. But but from time to time, you know, looking for something that is a, a true alternative. When you think about it, there's not a lot of options out there, frankly. You right. have just bland waters or you have very sugary cocktail. You have, you know, non alk beer, which is the same taste as beer. Um, right. So that's why we, we thought we had an opportunity. And, and we learned all of that from listening to consumers. Wow. So talk to me about your efforts in the non-alcoholic space. I, I wasn't aware that mm. you guys entered that category. Oh, yeah. We launched actually in, in January. So it's very recent. Um, but we we really saw an opportunity. Um, the For us, the unlock what to, was to realize that um, when you want to have a non-alcoholic drink in a social setting, you are a little bit ostracized, or at least you are you are a little bit ashamed, right? So I'm sure you've been in that situation where, for whatever reason, you you didn't want to have alcohol. That yeah, day. why are you drinking? People are looking at you like, right. yeah, right? Why? Why are you sick? Or and if you have a bottle um, of water, it kind of like it almost advertises that fact. If you're holding yeah, a water at a bar, correct? Or they are saying, yeah. like Liquid Death. I think they've had some great traction because. It almost looks like a can of beer. So you could drink water at a bar. And, and I think that was probably a key insight behind their entire go-to-market strategy. That's correct. And and when it comes to White Claw, we know we are a badge. We are a badge for consumers. So when you are having a, 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 a can of White Claws you're presenting in your hand, you know, it, it feels like an arc. It blends uh, in. Brand. It, 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 yeah, exactly. So, so uh, that avoids a little bit of the scrutiny and the interrogation and, frankly, the judgment that you're facing. Plus, it's yeah. delicious, so it doesn't it doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah, and it almost feels like you're not asking consumers to change their habits or behaviors because they're used to buying the White Claw brand on premise, and that they're still doing it. It just happens to be a different mm -hmm. type uh, or, or you know extension of the brand that doesn't have alcohol. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your role as CMO um, of White Claw. So, are you just focused on the White Claw brand? Are you focused on a larger part of the portfolio? And then secondly, what does the pie chart of your day look like as CMO? <laughs> oh, uh, so I am responsible for everything, which is RTD, so ready to drink. Um, and we have four big brands. Uh, White Claw is the biggest, of course, but we have Mike's Hard Lemonade, as I mentioned before. We have with Cayman Jack, which is a new kid on the block that is doing extremely well. Um, uh, tequila um, and margaritas and etc. And then we have Mixed, which is a, a much smaller brand, but, um, you know, a brand that really packs a, a punch. Um, you know, really fun, all about cocktails. So that's that's my uh, world, if you want, and I'm really in charge of everything related to brand building, um, communication, strategies. Uh, that that's what I do. So that's my day job. My night job is also to to be really the CMO when it comes to building the function, the marketing function at, at Mark Anthony. So you know, coordinating, setting the bar higher, uh, engaging with our community, making sure that we are training ourselves and sharpening the the soul on a day to day basis. Yeah. So these are broadly my my responsibilities. And in terms of your team and who you're looking for when you look for young or emerging talent to, to broaden the skill set of your team, what do you look for? And, and what advice can maybe we impart on some of our younger listeners here at the podcast in terms of areas they should be focused on? So first, I believe in diversity, if I may. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to, to build a team of different profiles, different experiences, different uh, personalities, because I think that through diversity, you are getting to better outcomes. So yeah. uh, I want to say that uh, in the first place. Um, obviously, um, in our case, we, we believe in um, recruiting people who are well-trained <laughs> in marketing and who ideally understand the Alec Beth category. But again, uh, for the sake of, of diversity, uh, we are definitely opening up and not just looking for people who come from the industry. Actually, I'm an example of that. <laughs> so, right. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important to have people coming from a different perspective. And, and then... This being said, you know, depending on junior, more senior, we, we need, again, diversity. So sometimes we people that we can completely mold. And, and in other cases, we, we want people who can come and hit the ground running. So when you look back at your career, um, Isabel, and, and you look at, you know, all the choices and decisions that you made, uh, you know, since being at PNG and maybe perhaps before then, what are some of the decisions that you think you made right? that put you in a position where you are today, where you're CMO of an important, fun, 
brand or, or group of brands um, and obviously enjoying what you do and, and, and working around the world? Mm. Hmm. I think early on in my career, I decided I would not stay in my comfort zone. So I did move actually after nine months. <laughs> it was the first time I, I changed country and relocated from Paris to uh, Brussels in Belgium. And I've done that several times in my career. We already talked about that. But I do believe that uh, taking risks um, in, you know, changing the environment I was living in, changing category, changing, you know, uh, everything uh, was a stretch, but definitely helped me grow faster. So that's one of the things I, 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 I did very early on. Um, something else um, I committed to is is really to enjoy what I was doing. So I was extremely Good fortunate board. at PNG. I really enjoyed the journey. As I said, never a dull moment, always something to learn and to and to develop. But it, it, it was very, very important to me. I work far too many hours a day <laughs> uh, to not to enjoy what I'm doing. So that's the other thing. I committed to do something that I like. And if I don't like, you know, then I really need to challenge myself and say, okay, maybe I'm not in the right place or, right. you know, I, I, I need to change. Uh, so I, I think that's probably the, the second um, biggest commitment, something that, that helped me uh, further develop in my career. Mm. Yeah, I think obviously you want to make sure that you love what you do. And I think a lot of people lose sight of that over time. And then it obviously has a direct correlation to their performance and why they're not spending that extra hour or why don't they come up with that good idea because mm. they just want to get away from work when they're done. And it's hard mm. to something if that's if you're running away from it yeah absolutely and something else i've seen is sometimes you get obsessed with you know being promoted or you know going faster on Those your career titles, ladder right? and everything instead of just enjoying the moment and what you're doing that's right. um so it's really important to, to enjoy the journey not be obsessed with the end goal always mm. yeah and, and with that is there a, a quote or mantra that comes to mind that you like to live by that kind of defines your professional career it's a great question uh this is something I actually do think a lot about. What, what is this compass that drives me? Uh, and uh, the mantra I, I, I follow since my time at PNG is consumer is boss. Yeah, it's really it's really something that I find is, is critical. You know, truly understanding the consumers, what they want, what they need, um, and 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 do everything you can to really meet their demands. You know, and try to make their lives a little bit better. So. Yeah. Consumers I'm big, boss. Big fan of that mantra and a uh, big fan of you and your work on what you're doing for White Call and the other brands you oversee. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I can't wait for our audience to hear about your journey. Thank you so much, Matt. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Likewise, on behalf of Susan, the Ad Week team, thanks again to Isabel Sakai, the global CMO of Mark Anthony Group, and one of my favorite brands, White Call, for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and Acast Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.